Hello to you all, wherever you are. Welcome to our online service for Pentecost. We hope that you'll be blessed by it and you will feel a sense of fellowship even though we cannot be together physically. Uh, today, Lucy will be leading the singing. Jan Peters will be talking about her faith. John Lambert will be bringing God's word to us. And Margaret Vaughan will be leading our prayers. Let's now start our worship with the, the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. My name is Jan and I've been coming along to All Saints Church for about 24 years with my husband Chris and uh, we brought our two girls up uh, at All Saints as well, they're all grown up now. Well I've been asked to share just a little bit of my story with you of how I came to know Jesus. Well it all began, funny enough, when I was born. Uh, yeah, no surprise there maybe, but I mention it because my parents used to tell me that I was born in the living room at home uh, in Stockton on Tees and uh, the midwife who was there whilst mum was in labour was sat reading her Bible and praying. So I mention that just because I think that's a really special start for anyone to have and um, along with that my parents used to tell me <laughs> sometimes that well they always wanted two children and I was number four so surprise um, and some would say Oh, so you were an accident then? Well, no, I don't think I was. Uh, I do believe that God has a plan and a purpose for all of our lives. And if we're here, it's for good reason. And so um, that's how my story began. So looking back, I do feel that God has wanted me here for a reason. And I've seen his plan and his purposes over the years. And he's blessed me so much. When I was about seven or eight, um, a friend of mine said, um, why don't you come with me to the Baptist Tabernacle, which is a big church in Stockton, 
and uh, it's great there. I asked my parents, they said yes, and off I went. And uh, it was there that I heard all about Jesus, that he wants to be my best friend. He wants to be Lord and Saviour of my life. And uh, so I remember sitting up in bed one night uh, when I was about seven or eight, asking Jesus into my life, asking him to be my best friend and Lord and Saviour. And that's something I've never, ever regretted uh, in my whole life. Best decision I've ever made. When I was 10, I took part in the children's choir, a musical. It was Easter time, 1975, at the Baptist Tabernacle. And at the end of the musical, we all sat down and the pastor got up and he gave what is called an altar call. He gave a little message and said, if anyone would like to come to the front and give their lives uh, to Jesus uh, publicly to commit your life, then please come to the front. And I think the Holy Spirit was very present that night and my legs just set off. I remember it well. So the rest of me, well, I guess I had to follow. Off I went, got to the front and I was prayed with and uh, I committed my life publicly that night when I was 10. Little did I know that at the same time up in the balcony, my mum was up there and she had a, an amazing experience of the Holy Spirit coming upon her. And when she used to talk about that afterwards, she would say that she'd always been a good Methodist, a good religious church person. But it wasn't until that night in 75 when the Holy Spirit came upon her that her life was transformed. And my dad saw that and it wasn't long before his life was transformed by God's Spirit as well. So I grew up in a home where together it was an open house where people came along, um, were prayed for, they came for tea. And people came to live with us and heard all about Jesus. And that was a real privilege. In my teenage years, there were people who lived with us who, uh, people with addictions, uh, people with phobias, uh, people that needed healing and prayer for all kinds of things. And uh, sometimes that was challenging, a little bit upsetting, slightly scary. Uh, but nevertheless, I would not have missed that for the world because I got to see God in action in amazing ways. I saw people's lives transformed, uh, phobias go, addictions disappear, people healed of all kinds of things. And I'm really thankful to God for that time. Um, and it built up my faith as a Christian. Um, right through the rest of my life, God has continued to be my guide and my provider and be so faithful to me. Um, when I was about 19, I prayed, Lord, could you send someone to be just a wonderful Christian husband? And he did. He sent Chris all the way from Somerset. And uh, he's a wonderful blessing. Uh, he came to work with the Church Army Voluntary Scheme in an unemployment centre in Stockton in the 80s. Uh, he didn't know anyone, but uh, he was working with punk rockers and skinheads and glue sniffers um, at a centre. And my parents went there. Uh, they were skinheads. They weren't. I'm joking. Uh, they went there to tell people about Jesus. Uh, they met Chris, invited him home for tea, of course, and uh, it wasn't long uh, before we realised that God's plan was for us to be together and to be married. Although I think the clinch was um, the night Chris bought, brought his guitar up and sang me a Cliff Richard song, but we'll move on from there. Uh, so God blessed us and he blessed us with two wonderful girls as well. And I could write a book on all of the times over the years that God has been our provider in wonderful ways. So, yeah, also another time uh, when the girl, once the girls had gone to school, I prayed, Lord, I'd love to work for you in ministry. And he's blessed me so much by allowing me to be the children and families worker at All Saints, which I've done for nearly 20 years now. And it's my privilege and joy to help children from the youngest upwards to about 11 year old to know Jesus from a young age just like I did so I love that that's just brilliant so I could say so much but my time is nearly up but I just like to say if you have not met Jesus yet then I can thoroughly recommend him don't miss out uh, on living your life without Jesus because he's amazing and wouldn't be without him he's with me in all the great times, all the good times of life, but also being with me in all the stormy times, the difficult times. He's my strength and my rock and he's so faithful and he would be the same for you. 
So if you'd like to know more about Jesus, please do contact us at All Saints. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, if you like, maybe read your Bible, maybe pray, maybe just talk to God and say, hey, if you're there, if you're real, I'd like to know you. Um, so, yeah, and I'm saying this to adults, but actually children, if you're watching as well, um, I hope you've heard my story of how I came to know Jesus when I was young. And I would say to you, children, don't wait. You don't have to wait until you're an adult, you know. You can come to know Jesus uh, from being very little. Uh, he loves you so much and uh, you can ask him into your life as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening to a little bit of my story. God bless you all. Well, good morning. Good to see you again. This is the last in our series on sharing faith, and I hope you've enjoyed it and that it's helped you, along with our weekly testimonies, to have a little bit more confidence when you're talking to others about your story and about the Lord. Essentially, I want to say that sharing faith is not really that hard. Funnily enough, somebody once said that sometimes evangelism, or the best evangelism, is simply telling somebody you're a Christian and then not being a complete jerk. And anybody can do that, even me. Well, today, to conclude this series, we're thinking about sharing faith as an act of witness. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus makes it really clear here that he wants a church that is distinctive, distinctive from the communities around it. Jesus expects us Indeed, he commissions us to stand out in the world. But if you ask anybody what salt is for, you will tend to get two answers. In fact, this week I asked several people what they thought salt is most useful for. And I basically got two answers. We use it for seasoning and preserving. Salt is used to make food taste more interesting. But the biggest complaint from teenagers and others, incidentally, about church is probably that it's boring. That's the biggest complaint we have about church. It's boring. Listen, if somebody landed at Galilee Airport in the first century and they got into a taxi and they said to the driver, just take me to where the action is, every driver would have put their foot on the gas and headed straight for wherever Jesus was. Now, I rarely use the word unforgivable because God can forgive anything, can't he? But a movement founded by the most intoxicating, the most wonderful, the most electrifying figure who ever walked the earth, letting itself go to the point that it has a reputation for being dull and boring is almost unforgivable. You, said Jesus, are the salt of the earth. You have been given a mission to take what is exciting and not make it boring. Now, salt, as I just said, adds flavour to unappetising food, but it also stops food from going off. Uh, cured meat like parma ham, which has had coarse salt rubbed into it, can keep virtually forever. And when Jesus talks about salt in Matthew's Gospel, he means that the world is decaying. It 
it's going rotten. It's on its way to putrefying and stinking. Jesus does not think that the world is basically okay and that Christians can make it nicer. Jesus doesn't think that the world needs improving. Jesus thinks the world needs saving. It was a Christian, of course, William Wilberforce, who fought tirelessly to abolish the slave trade in this country. It was a Christian, Martin Luther King, who achieved the outlawing of racist segregation in the USA 50 years ago now. 60% uh, of AIDS relief programmes in Africa are run by churches, as are the vast majority of food banks in the UK today. You are the salt of the earth. But even though Jesus will have watched his mother Mary uh, using salt in the kitchen, and so he possibly had seasoning and preserving in mind, when Jesus talked about salt, he was probably thinking of two completely different uses to that. Uh, and we find this in Luke chapter 14, verse 44, where Jesus's words about salt are expanded somewhat. And the fuller version says this, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. Jesus is talking about two other properties of salt, ones you might not actually guess. He actually meant uh, salt as a fertiliser for the soil and as an antiseptic for the manure heap. And that's why Jesus used the expression salt of the earth and not salt of the kitchen. Uh, what they called salt in New Testament times isn't exactly what we have as salt today. It wasn't this. It was, in fact, unrefined, coarse uh, mixture. You still find it today on the shores of the Dead Sea. It's rich in sodium chloride, what we call salt, but it also contains potash and many other minerals as well. And you get this salt and you have to dilute it a bit, but when you do, it's excellent for the soil. And it also favours the strong growth of healthy crops. But if you dilute it too much, you have to dilute it a little, but if you do it too much, it loses its properties and it becomes useless. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, if salt loses its saltiness, too diluted. So Jesus calls you and me the salt of the earth because he calls you and me to be in the growth business, actively promoting the increase of his government and peace. Many of the parables Jesus spoke are about growth. Have you noticed that? The growth of the yeast, the mustard seed, the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Colossians chapter 1 says all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and it's growing. And we pray, says Paul, that you may bear fruit in every good work. So are you growing? Are you fruitful? Are you a net giver? Are you joyful? Are you helping faith to grow around you? Are you an encourager? Are you a catalyst for love and good works? Well, I wonder if you've ever had to fill in one of those forms in hospital, which asks you what religion you are. Um, what do you write when you get one of those films? We don't tend to talk about Church of England or Catholic as our religion, do we? In fact, we, we don't feel comfortable with the word religion at all on the whole. We, we identify as Christians, don't we, basically? But there's never a box to tick for Christians on those forms, is there? And um, my advice, which I got from a friend called Andy Griffiths, is this. You check the hospital website, for photos of the chaplaincy team and you have a look at their faces look at their faces and then you either write down the religion of the one who looks most likely to cheer you up in the Lord or better still the one who most looks like he needs witnessing to be the salt of the earth in hospital and so salt is used for seasoning preserving fertilising in Jesus's culture, but also sanitising. It was an antiseptic. Uh, if salt loses its saltiness, 
it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap, said Jesus. Well, there were no drains in those days in that part of the world, and, and so people threw salt on the dunghill, which was always downwind from the village, understandably, and the salt fumigated this uh, dunghill to keep away flies and rats. And the gospel, the power of Christian love, can decontaminate even the most destructive evil environment. Uh, in February last year, a man called Brenton Wynn, he was a homeless 23-year-old drug addict, uh, broke into and vandalised Central Baptist Church in Conway, Arkansas. He caused about $100,000 worth of damage. He destroyed practically everything in sight in this church and he smashed laptops, cameras, various other pieces of expensive equipment. And he also painted a, a racial slur on the walls of this church and he, he set fire to the church's family centre. And the pastor of this church, a man called Don Chandler, said, I really don't know what would possess a person to do this. Well, following his arrest, Wynne faced a long list of criminal charges. But Pastor Chandler spoke to the prosecutors and he requested that the man be shown grace and forgiveness rather than prosecuted and condemned. And he said this, he said, you cannot preach something for 50 years without practising it. Had we not shown him some grace, he said, everything we've talked about would have gone by the wayside. It, it was simply the right thing to do. Uh, this was a young man who had made some mistakes. He was on drugs, he was on alcohol when he did what he did, but he was redeemable. Well, the judge considered the pastor's request and he offered this young man, Win uh, a choice. He said, you can either spend the next 20 years in jail or you can voluntarily attend a 12-month Christian rehab and recovery programme. Well, what would you do? He chose the latter. And during that time, this young man, Brenton Wynne, accepted Jesus as his saviour and Lord. Six months after he'd broken into and vandalised this church, Brenton Wynne returned there to be baptised and publicly dedicate his life to the Lord. And his testimony, when he was baptised, in his testimony he said this, my life was nothing but chaos, suicide attempts and brokenness. But I'm starting to understand now how God works. I realised I didn't pick the church that night. God picked me. So salt is a disinfectant. And Jesus wants to cleanse all that is putrid. He wants to use us. You are the salt of the earth. So salt seasons. It preserves. It promotes growth. It disinfects. Snow also, of course, melts snow, but I'm sure Jesus wasn't thinking about that when he spoke about salt. Finally, I want to say on salt, salt irritates. If you apply salt to your skin, it, it chafes, doesn't it? It stings. And real living Christianity sometimes rubs this world up the wrong way, seriously. Jesus annoyed the stuffy religious people like the Pharisees of his day. He wound up the snidey intellectuals like the Sadducees. He rubbed opinionated windbags like Herod up the wrong way. Jesus was loved by the common people who heard him gladly. He was a friend of sinners, but he didn't have to tick off the establishment of his day. Well, I'm not advocating here gratuitous offence, of course not, but sometimes following Jesus means ruffling a few feathers and being a bit of an irritant. John Ortberg, in his lovely book, Soul Keeper, describes a real conversation that a friend of his had in a restaurant one time. Uh, he was reading his Bible in this restaurant, or cafe I think it may have been, and he was um, 
reading it to prepare a sermon when a, a young woman sat just opposite him and she looked over and she said, uh, why are you reading that? Well, he looks back at her and says, this is an exact quote, by the way, he said, because I don't feel like going to hell when I die. <laughs> that is salt as an irritant right there. Well, this woman, she's confident, she's articulate, she's an atheist, and she says there's no such thing as heaven or hell. He says, why do you say that? She says, everybody knows that when you die, your candle goes out and that's it. He says, you mean to tell me that there's no afterlife? She says, no. So he says, that means you must be able to live just as you please. That's right, she says. Like there's no judgment day or anything, he says. Right, she says. He says, well, that, that's, uh, that's fascinating to me. Where did you hear that? She said, well, I read it somewhere. He says, can you give me the name of the book? She says, uh, I don't recall. He says, can you give me the name of the author of the book? She says, I forgot his name. <laughs> he says, well, did that author write any other books that you know of? She said, I don't know. He says, is it possible that your author may have changed his or her mind years after they wrote this particular book and then they wrote another one that said that there is a heaven and a hell? Is that possible? She says, well, it's possible, but it's not likely. Well, he says, all right, um, let's, let's get this straight. You, he said, you're rolling the dice on your entire eternity, predicated on what someone you don't even know wrote in a book you cannot recall the title of. Have I got that straight? She looks back. She says, that's right. He says, do you know what? Do you know what I think? I think you have merely created a belief that protects your chosen lifestyle. I think you made that up, he says, because it's very discomforting to think of a heaven. It's very disturbing to think of a hell. It's very unnerving to think of facing a holy God on the day of reckoning. He says, I think you made all that up. Well, that is salt as an irritant right there. And Jesus also says, you are the light of the world. Uh, Jesus is saying here, I want you to be visible. Uh, don't hide away. A lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, God expects his church to be a beacon in its community. An invisible church is about as useful to God as a torch with a flat battery. The uh, great evangelical statesman, Anglican minister John Stott once said, if a house is dark at night, there's no sense in blaming the house for the darkness. That is what happens when the sun goes down. The question is, where's the light? And similarly, he says, if society becomes corrupt, like a dark night, there's no sense in blaming society for its corruption. That is what happens when human evil goes unchecked and unrestrained. The question to ask is, where is the church? See, being light in a dark world does not mean self-righteous Christians uh, tutting and wagging their fingers. It's not our light. It's not our innate goodness shining out of every orifice. It's the light of Christ's love that just radiates through us. It's his light, not our light. And here's a question for you. See if you can guess. How much of what we read about Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, situates him outside of a religious building. Now, if you were to put a percentage on that, what would you say? What proportion of the Gospels show Jesus outside a synagogue or a temple or a holy shrine? 
75%, 90%? The answer is over 95%. Jesus said in verse 16, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When you do random acts of kindness in the name of Jesus, you find so often that God opens up doors to engage with people spiritually. Here's an example. Uh, a few years ago now, a man came into the centre at church, and if memory serves, he was the, I think he might have been the grandfather of one of the toddlers who come to our groups on Thursday and Friday mornings. Anyway, he was there, he was in the foyer, and he was grumbling about his back pain. And the easiest thing in the world would have been, you know, a, a bit of tea and sympathy, and to say, oh, well, I hope you're feeling better soon. Well, I think it was Sandra, it would have, that's just like Sandra, I'm sure it was her, who said to him, well, would you like us to pray um, right now that God will heal you? And she, she lays hands on this guy. Do you know, I'm not even sure if she waited for his reply. Um, and she asked God to take away the pain. And as she did that, ooh, the man said, you know what, I can feel heat in my back as you pray. And by the time she'd said amen, the pain had all but gone. When he phoned her up later to say, you know, it's still better, this is really amazing. I wish God did amazing things every time I step out in faith and pray. He doesn't even do amazing things every time Sandra steps out in faith and prays. But I so, so wish he did. But that's his business. It's not my business. I can't control it. I just know that I am called to be salt and light where I am. I was talking to um, a Christian. I think he must have been in his mid-twenties once. This was a few years ago now. And I asked him how he met his girlfriend. Well, it wasn't in a church context at all. It was at work as it happens. But he knew she was a Christian. He knew she was. She wasn't wearing a cross necklace around her neck. She didn't have a car sticker with a fish or something on her car. She didn't hum Amazing Grace at the photocopying machine as she copied her papers. She didn't draw attention to her Bible ostentatiously as she, as she had coffee in the coffee break. He just saw something in her that so reminded him of Jesus that he guessed she's got to be a Christian. And he guessed right. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So there we are, sharing faith as a witness. <clears throat> Can you hear the voice of God calling you to be like salt, bringing a taste of heaven to your neighbourhood and sanitising all that's foul and ungodly? Can you hear Jesus saying, you, yes, you are the salt of the earth. Is he speaking to you today about being a bit more visible as a Christian? Nobody sticks a light under a bowl, says Jesus. Is your light hidden away today? Is it time to shine a bit more brightly, to speak out, to, to take a risk, to go for it, to be a beacon where you are? When are you going to shine like you know you want to? Can you hear the voice of Jesus today saying to you, you are the light of the world? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful words of our Lord Jesus about salt and light. And as we think about sharing our faith as a witness in our world, we ask, Lord, in your great kindness and goodness that you would equip us to do that. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. May the peace of Jesus be with us all today and always. Now, if we were together in church, we would move around and share the peace. As it is, let's keep silence for a few moments and just remember, bring up in our minds uh, a few people who would normally be in our church fellowship and pray for them in quiet. Let us pray. Our Gospel reading reminds us to let our light shine before others. Lord, we give thanks for those whom we have had contact with this week, whose light has shone on us. For those who have been there for us, those we know who have been looking out for us. Lord, thank you for these people. We pray for those family and friends for whom we are anxious at this time. May we be a light to them. We are conscious of those who mourn the loss of loved ones and whose lives has been forever changed over the last few weeks. And Lord, we pray for those we know who are in need of your healing touch at this time. We pray for the church throughout the world as we gather in our different ways. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that we and all your children may be free to worship you. We pray for the church family at All Saints, for those who are facing changes, moving to new callings in their service of you, Lord considering next steps in their education, or uncertainty about their future employment. We lift these situations to you now. And finally, we take a moment in quietness to recall the great goodness of God, inviting his grace to make us worthy of our calling to be the salt of the earth. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And together with followers of Jesus across our community, as our Saviour taught us, we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We end our service with some words from St Paul's letter to the Christians at Thessalonica. They're adapted, but they go like this. We will be of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, healing the afflicted, and honouring everyone, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all and all whom we love, today and forever. Amen.